So good evening, everybody. Uh, oh, lots of chat from everybody. Good evening from everywhere around the world. Malaysia, JD, we've got Marcio in Lisbon, Portugal, Chicago. It's a very much a global event. Uh, I guess this is part of the uh, Kuala Lumpur, uh, part of the appeal of doing these events online is that we actually speak to a global audience. Um, so good evening and welcome um, to this event. Um, tonight, we're going back in time. We're going back to 1987, when EMU launched the SP-1200 drum machine. This machine has been used in many, many tracks across all genres. You may well have heard film tracks with this instrument in it. And over those years, it's kind of set a standard. But also over that time, its designer, Dave Rossum, has been involved in the design of many, many influential instruments. Not just the drum machine, but sampling technology and a wide range of other digital audio technologies. And also uh, his CV, if you will, includes um, chip design um, as well as instrument design. Uh, so tonight we have the inside track, the, the, the word from the horse's mouth, as it were, of how this influential and iconic machine came into being and why all these years later it has been reissued and how. So that's enough for me. It's time to hand over to tonight's guest speaker, Dave Rossum of EMU, and now Blossom Electro Music. The floor is yours, Dave. If you can unmute. There we go. Okay. Am I coming through? Loud and clear. Okay, good. Um, and, I can, I, is, is, and I can actually see an SP1200 behind you. Yes, yes, that's one of the, the new units I'll be talking about. This is my home lab. We're still, uh, uh, among other things, I am also a um, uh, 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 technical fellow at Universal Audio. Uh, I work for them part time and uh, they, uh, uh, their main building is still somewhat limited access due to COVID concerns and things like that. We're getting back in the building some of the time, but uh, uh, this is my lab for both Ross and Electro Music, my company, and you know, my work at Universal Audio. Um, I don't think there's anything proprietary back there, or if it is, probably the resolution isn't good enough to see it. So I'm here in, in Santa Cruz. It's 11 in the morning over here. And uh, um, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Neil, for inviting me to, to share this talk. And I think I'm now going to share my PowerPoint screen because uh, it's probably a lot more interesting than viewing my face. So let's see how that goes. I'll just press share screen here. Share sound as well. And let's see if this works. Are you seeing a slide that says SP1200 at the top of it? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. <laughs> okay, so... Um, uh, I want to talk today about the SP-1200 and um, uh, the changes that it has wrought in the music industry. Um, and I think I'm going to reverse Neil's time machine a little further and go back to the very beginning of my career as I start the talk here. Um, I did my undergraduate work uh, at uh, Caltech in Pasadena, uh, got a degree in molecular biology and went to University of California, Santa Cruz, uh, to do graduate work in the biochemistry of the ribosome. Uh, my advisor, a professor named Harry Noller, who uh, um, is now very well known for his work on the ribosome, um, invited me one day to uh, go over with him to uh, one of the colleges on the UC campus, College 5, where they just received the brand new Moog synthesizer. Um, and it was sort of like God taking you by the no nose and pointing you in a different direction. By that evening, I was uh, um, teaching the music students how to play the synthesizer, even though 
I'm not a musician and I'd never seen a synthesizer in the flesh before in my life. Um, and something just clicked. Uh, I started studying the schematics that came with the Moog. And uh, over the summer of 1971, I took a, um, a leave of absence from my um, uh, fellowship as a graduate student and uh, um, uh, decided to build a synthesizer. And uh, um, uh, um, ultimately, that turned into starting a company and dropping out of graduate school. And that company was named Emu Systems. Our first product was uh, a modular analog electronic synthesizer. Uh, here, that's me, uh, probably about 1979, 1978, that's what I look like. Um, had considerably more hair back then. Uh, in front of uh, uh, the, the typical modular synthesizer we had uh, in our facility, um, we were in Scotts Valley for a while and then moved back to Santa Cruz, my, my roots. Um, and this was a very no, well-known synthesizer. We didn't sell an awful lot of them, a few hundred, but they are very much prized today. And uh, at least one has been in continuous service at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago from uh, the early 70s until the present. Uh, one of the innovations in the EMU modular system was the polyphonic keyboard. Uh, up until that time, when you played a note on a synthesizer, it would play uh, on the keyboard synthesizer, synthesizer keyboard, excuse me, uh, it would play one or maybe two notes, maybe the lowest or the highest note. And I worked out, uh, um, my interest in biology, by the way, was in using computers in biology, so it isn't too radical a change to go into electronics and biology. Um, but uh, I worked out the algorithms by which you could actually control multiple channels of a synthesizer with a keyboard, built that initially out of discrete uh, um, TTL, uh, SSI and MSI parts, uh, and then eventually redesigned that in 1977 when the microprocessor became popular using a, a Z80 microprocessor. So that was the introduction to our CPUs at, uh, at EMU Systems. Um, we also uh, uh, designed a series of chips with a company called Sol Solid State Music, then renamed to Solid State Microtechnology, both of which were abbreviated SSM. These were analog um, uh, ICs that were done on a, it's sort of the equivalent of an analog gate array. There was an array of transistors that you could uh, interconnect with an arbitrary metal layer. Um, and we built voltage controlled oscillators, voltage controlled filters, voltage controlled amplifiers, uh, voltage controlled envelope generators, uh, with the intent of making uh, complex analog synthesizers possible. And the, uh, um, the first uh, product to really take that out in a big way was uh, um, Dave Smith of Sequential Circuits, who was a good friend. Um, wanted to go the next level from designing sequencers to designing an actual keyboard. And we uh, uh, teamed up with him. He uh, asked us to design the analog circuitry using these SSM chips for the Prophet 5. And uh, uh, interestingly enough, Dave Smith also uh, used our Z80 development system to develop all the software. And the Prophet 5 was uh, uh, brought to the market in 1979 and he was paid royalties on that design. Another thing that was happening in the 70s, uh, we uh, um, sold actually the first polyphonic keyboard system to uh, Leon Russell, a, a well-known uh, music artist. Um, and uh, um, when Leon came out to visit EMU and uh, order his synthesizer, we discovered that uh, his synthesizer programmer, a fellow named Roger Lynn, was really the instigator of this whole thing. Um, so we delivered Leon his uh, 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 polyphonic synthesizer and uh, stayed friends with Roger Lynn as he then went on to work on the drum machine. Uh, now the state of the art back then, uh, there was a drum machine uh, by Wurlitzer called the Sideman. It was introduced uh, actually in 1959. And uh, Ace Tone, which I think ultimately became, was renamed Roland. Uh, they're, they're closely related and I don't know if they were just the same people or it was actually the same company. Uh, had some very early drum machines, and probably the one, the brand that is known now as the Boss, 
label from Roland. Um, and the DR55 was really the first um, semi-modern drum machine. But these things were all very fixed patterns. Uh, and that was all broken when Roger Lynn invented the drum computer, the LM1. Uh, his partner was Moffat, so LM stands for Lynn Moffat. Um, Roger designed this with a Z80 CPU. He got uh, in touch with me at EMU and asked me to do the design review on the product. I've forgotten what, if anything, I contributed to the original product, but uh, um, in uh, 1980, this was introduced and was absolutely revolutionary. Uh, from a review at the time, uh, I'll read the real essence of what made Lin, the Lin important lies, if you haven't guessed by now, in its name. Not the Lin drum machine or the Lin rhythm unit or what have you, but the Lin drum computer. Because not only did Roger uh, create drum sounds from uh, digital samples, but he created ways of controlling it uh, where you could set up your own patterns and chains of patterns. I think that was the terminology he used. You could enter it in real time. You could edit in real time. The computer could auto correct your rhythms and adjust them with, with, with features like shuffle and swing. All of these, um, which are very common in drum machines today, these were all the innovations that Roger came out with in the LM1. It truly was an absolute revolution. Here's a photograph. I think this photograph is actually of the Lindrum, not the LM1. The LM1 was a, a little bit sloppier inside, but they are basically the same machine, along with a block diagram of how this was accomplished. Uh, there's a Z80 CPU subsystem that's living up on this board over here uh, with along with the panel controls and so on. And the Z80 could trigger any one of a series of counters. Those counters are these black ICs down in the lower board. Uh, each counter would count off addresses of uh, an erasable programmable read-only memory. Those are these big chips down here with the labels on them telling what they've been programmed to. And then each one of these possible drum sounds that you could sound has its own uh, companding D to A converter. For those of you not familiar with the terminology ComDAC, it's companding digital to analog converter. And what that is, it's a, it's a, um, a converter that takes 8-bit data, but rather than that being linearly coded, uh, it's using a coding used in telephony called the mu law, which has smaller steps when the signal is closer to zero. So it has more of a constant level of quantization distortion uh, rather than high distortion at low levels and low distortion at high levels that a linear coding would do. So these were nonlinear DACs. As I recall at the time, they cost about eight or nine dollars a piece. And as a result, with the cost of uh, uh, EPROMs and Comdax and one for each possible sound. This was quite uh, quite an expensive machine. I think it originally sold for five thousand dollars, and then the Lindrum was cost reduced and brought down to um, somewhere between three and four thousand, as I recall. Now, meanwhile, back at EMU, we'd uh, done this design and we're getting royalties in the profit five. Um, but Sequential decided to switch from the SSM chips uh, to Doug Curtis's chips and uh, came up with a Profit Rev 3 and um, uh, informed EMU that they weren't going to pay royalties on the design anymore. Uh, as a result, we were counting on that, uh, um, uh, that revenue, uh, so we needed a product very quickly. Uh, that all happened right about the time of the 1980 AES show in Los Angeles, where the two hot items were a very expensive digital synthesizer called the Fairlight Computer Music Instrument, Fairlight CMI. Um, and uh, uh, that was an instrument that cost about thirty to $40,000 in its full implement, implementation. And I saw a way that the Fairlight could be substantially reduced in cost. So, um, came up with the idea of what ultimately became the EMU's first digital synthesizer product, the emulator, uh, which uh, was a sampling keyboard. If we look inside, 
the Fairlight versus the emulator. The Fairlight's remarkably similar to a uh, um, Roger CPU in that it has all these parallel channels out here of, um, uh, but each one actually includes a full slave CPU um, and a full 16K of random access memory. So in order to play the, um, uh, I believe it was, uh, uh, six channels was the maximum you could get out of a, a Fairlight. You had to have six CPUs, six memories that would hold the sound that each note would make, and all of the associated processing power, plus a master CPU that did a lot of other stuff. My vision was to use a single Z80 CPU, um, used a banking scheme to instead of the 64K that a Z80 CPU supports, uh, you could put 128k of this memory on it and use uh, simple DMA channels rather than separate CPUs to feed that audio data into a counter and latch and an individual companding DAC over here. The Fairlight used a linear DAC and so the fidelity of the emulator was also better. But you can see with one computer and one set of memory over here, uh, the cost of the, to build this thing was considerably less and the emulator was introduced at a, an eight channel version costing just under $10,000 in 1981. Um, the emulator was uh, 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 a big excitement in the industry at the NAMM show in, uh, in January, 1981. Stevie Wonder walked up to our booth and hugged the instrument and proceeded to buy serial number one. Daryl Dragon, uh, also known as the captain of uh, the music duo, the captain and Tennille was also a huge fan of it. There was a group in San Francisco uh, called the Residents. They bought four instruments and uh, we were pretty happy with the sales. We planned to sell five of these units a month and did so like clockwork up until November, 1981. And suddenly we couldn't sell any more of them. Um, we had none, no sales for November, no sales for December. Um, we almost sold the design to another company until we realized that they didn't know any more than we did why the sales had halted. But then in January 82, we decided to relaunch the product. Memory had dropped down in cost, so we were able to lower the cost of the instrument. Um, we added what were basically software features, a sequencer and um, the ability to multi sample, in other words, put multiple samples across the same keyboard. Um, and then what we think was ultimately the most important change, the original emulator came with five diskettes that had just each diskette had two, um, two samples on it for the keyboard. Um, we would acquired over the, the past year, a lot more samples. And so we uh, discs being fairly inexpensive included 25 discs with lots of sounds. And in January 1982, we started taking orders and uh, uh, the uh, uh, sales volumes went up and the emulator one once again became a big hit. We followed the emulator one with our first drum machine. And here is where we took Roger's fairly expensive design and innovated to bring the cost down very similar way to what we'd done to the Fairlight. Uh, Still had a Z80 CPU, but rather than having all those EEPROMs, we combined the sound memory into a single integrated memory, much like what we did in the emulator. And we implemented that memory as a mask ROM, which brought down the cost even more. Uh, we designed a um, microcontroller uh, built with um, uh, uh, low power TTL, and maybe there was some CMOS in it back then, um, MSI components that could take multiple sounds out of this mask ROM and time, share, time domain multiplex them into a single ComDAC. So we now only had a single D to A converter. And because you want different levels of the different drum sounds, we followed that with a, a, a CMOS multiplying DAC so that each sample could have its own level demultiplex that into eight individual channels using an analog mux and eight sample and holes and out came your eight different drum machines drum sounds uh, the drumulator was uh, similar to the 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 uh, 
change we did to the Fairlight, uh, Roger's machine was costing uh, $3,000 or more. The drumulator was introduced at $995 and was a huge hit as soon as it came out. Time goes on. We uh, um, revised the emulator into an emulator two instrument and then focused on our next product, which we wanted to be an improvement on the drumulator. Uh, Roger and his company, Lin Electronics, was working on a successor to the Lin Drum, which would become the Lin 9000. And if we wanted to do a new drumulator, we needed to up the fidelity, more sounds, more features, and still keep it at a competitive price. And thus, the Drumulator 2 was born. This is an actual copy of one of the few remaining source code documents that's left from back in the early 1980s, uh, written in 1984. And this code was actually written by uh, EMU employee Donna Murray, uh, who was the first woman graduate in uh, electronic engineering from MIT. Donna was an absolutely brilliant engineer and her first project was to write this micro microcode for the Drumulator 2, which included um, in that micro sequencer that we had in the Drumulator 1, slightly expanding the hardware and enabling it to shift the pitch of the, uh, of the sounds. In 1985, uh, we realized the Drumulator 2 wasn't a very good name, so we changed it to SP12, SP standing for sampling percussion. And um, in this machine, uh, we included user sampling. Users could now not only listen to their drum sounds, they could sample it into a battery backed up random access memory. We had that pitch shifting algorithm using uh, a fairly primitive way of pitch shifting, but uh, it sounded pretty decent with the percussive sounds. Uh, rather than using the COM DAC, we'd expanded to a 12-bit linear DAC. Uh, other features were a full MIDI implementation. MIDI by now in 1985 was uh, pretty much de rigueur for any product. And we also included uh, SMPTE Sync because we'd learned that a lot of people were syncing their drum machines uh, via uh, tape tracks uh, with, with, with SMPTE timecode on them. So the SP12 had a full SMPTE Sync implementation. Uh, we had our um, uh, SSM 2044 voltage control filters for a couple of the channels to uh, um, make uh, uh, much nicer, uh, less less edgy drum sounds with with dynamic filtering and to store these user samples we needed some way that uh, uh, the user could create a sound library uh, so we used the disk drive out of the commodore 64 computer that at the time was popular and um, reverse engineered their protocol and you could plug in a commodore 64 drive the sp12 and save your sounds. And I say sort of because as we uh, got into production and began saving things, we realized how abysmally slow that Commodore drive was. So um, it worked, but uh, uh, it wasn't really a customer delight feature. If we look inside an SP12, let's first look over at the uh, block diagram over here. Once again, a Z80 CPU, we have a battery here and we backed up the uh, the SRAM so that when you turn the power off it will remember all of the Z80 parameters and also the um, uh, user uh, sound memory is in this battery backed up static memory of the the black chips without the labels here uh, we went back rather than using mask prom we used the um, the greater flexibility of EPROMs for the fixed sounds that that always came with the instrument in these EPROMs over here and um, went from a 16 to a 24 bit microcontroller so those extra eight bits could uh, keep the fractional phase that allowed the pitch control and that microcontroller is this set of ICs over in here um, the Z80 subsystem is right underneath the power mechanism over in here we then went to the 12-bit DAC with its associated interface up in here. There's an anti-aliasing filter for the sample input right there. Once again, a multiplying DAC to be able to control the outputs. Analog mux and sample and holds uh, going to 
uh, channels with either unfiltered or fixed filtered or those dynamic SSM filter channels. Uh, audio cable up to a relatively simple front panel board. Um, I think the SP12 started with the list price somewhere $2,700, $2,800. And um, it was successful. Most interestingly, that was about the time of the birth of the hip hop movement. And we weren't really in tune with this. Um, uh, we uh, uh, um, heard about hip hop and uh, um, it was really interesting to us. Uh, my my uh, uh, EMU co-founder, Scott Wedge, talked about uh, discovering it, listening to the first hip hop tracks and going, gee, this language is kind of coarse. And then realizing, you know, this is the music that Scott and I uh, were into during our, our teen and college years, the same music in the, the uh, mid to late 60s. It was more protest music. It was not just uh, um, love songs and things like this. And um, so we decided we really liked the idea of hip hop. But one of the first people to use it was Sed G from a group called the Ultramagnetic MCs. And uh, he, in an interview, uh, said the SP-12 was like a gift to me. Um, he stayed in the crib for two weeks reading the manuals, practicing, nothing else on his mind. Uh, and then he met up with Paul C., who we'll learn about on the next slide. And Paul C. was into it too. So they started sharing secrets with each other. Paul C. McCasty was um, a bass player for a group called the Mandolin Lee Roadshow. And in 1986, uh, under his mentor, Moogie Kligman, decided he was more interested in becoming a producer. And um, I, I think he went to a music store to, to buy something else and saw an SP-12 and decided he had to have one, uh, brought it home, started creating beats in his bedroom, um, got a job at that, at that store, the, the, the um, um, 1212 Studios in Queens, um, and started mentoring so many other hip hop artists on how to use the SP-12. So he may be the guy that created the SP-12 as that iconic hip hop drum machine. Um, uh, and uh, until he died tragically in 1989, he taught all kinds of artists the techniques of the SP-12 and the SP-1200. Um, this uh, album, Critical Beatdown, I think was the first hip hop album but there's some debate as to whether it might have been a Beastie Boys album instead. I'm going to take a break right now and change uh, my screen so that I can share the demo track uh, and you can hear what an SP-12 actually sounded like. So I'm going to hit stop share. Go back to my picture here. And now I'm going to try, try and share different screen. And I'm going to start this up and stop it. And somebody can tell me if the audio is coming through. Is that audible? I, I can hear it. Yes. Okay, great. Then I will go ahead and proceed to play. This is called Lute Fist Dance. It was created by a friend of mine, Gary Hull. And um, uh, we'll listen to it. And I'll tell you a little story about it afterwards. It's about just about two minutes long.
So um, Gary, in addition to be a, being a technician, in fact, Gary's actually all, still my technician today at Universal Audio, um, he was a, a, a clinician and would go and uh, present this uh, as a demo of the SP-12, and he would have a rack full of uh, several EMU, uh, you know, a, an emulator and an emulator 2 and, uh, um, and the SP-12, and he'd start playing this demo. Um, and then he'd go and yank out the MIDI chords because everyone thought that that demo was being done by all the synthesizers in the rack. Uh, and it was entirely done on the SP-12, all the synthesizer-like sounds and so on. All of those are just being done out of the, the channels of the SP-12. Um, so let me uh, once again share my screen, go back to our PowerPoint. So. Um, Paul C., uh, as I said, spread the word. Uh, many of the um, uh, hip hop arts of the time uh, talk about their time with him, uh, Mikey D. At that time, it was in a herve to be dope and white. That just blew my goddamn mind. Razelle, he was one of the first to put together a uh, song that was all vocals. The only person who came close to what Paul was doing was Bobby McFerrin. And this is in 1985. Large professor who's a huge fan of Paul C. He took me out of the tape deck era. He was like, this is the SP-12. This is the machine you want to rock with. Uh, Rakim, he started teaching me how to use the SP-12. After that, it was a wrap. Um, and then Pete Rock, when I heard a little from my nice ego trip and I fell in love with it, said, gee, made that. Him and Paul, see, they was getting, and I'm not sure what the stars were the, in, in this quote. Uh, I still don't know how they did the drums on Give Me Drum or some enough. Respect due to Paul C. That was right cat right there he was finding some real ill beat so uh, all these hip-hop artists got that this was really where things took off now at the same time we were realizing how bad that uh, uh commodore disk drive uh was uh the prices of physical disk drives were dropping uh the price of dynamic ram was dropping and so we decided to do a modification on the sp12 to make it into the sp1200 um, we expanded the sound memory from the maximum you could get on an sp12 was five seconds up to 10 seconds we added a floppy drive using circuitry that we derived from uh, uh, the emulator one and uh, um, i note down here by tony dean because uh, he was a ua uh, uh, still is a ua artist um, so the sp12 you can see looks similar in its board, we have the microcontroller still exactly the same over here, the Z80 subsystem up here, the DAX output sample and holes, output filters, but we've cut a big hole in the circuit board so that the disk drive will fill, fill in. And we were able to do that because the dynamic memory over here, these 12 chips here are much smaller than that huge bank of static RAM chips that we had previously. Um, so, uh, um, we basically just changed this portion of the drive to make dynamic RAM and a floppy disk interface, which now can load the dynamic RAM. And that is the SP-1200. Um, again, a bunch of quotes. Pete Rock, once the SP-1200 came out, I basically fell in love with it. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, made the SP-1200 sound was that 10 second limit because um, you then take and you'd uh, 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 take a sound you wanted to sample, speed it up by running your turntable faster, um, and then you slow it down with the pitch shifting on the SP1200, and it created uh, the sound with with a unique distortion to it. Um, uh, it sounded dirty, uh, um, and uh, uh, and and people just uh, loved that. Um, and the other thing was that there was a court decision that. Uh, prevented the use of just recording a large loop off of a, a album and playing that over using uh, uh, tape or, or, or uh, a recorder. Instead, you, it was okay to sample little sounds, but you couldn't sample uh, loops. So as Easy Moby said, don't just sample from now on, play samples. And that was what the SP-1200 did superbly. We called it the product that wouldn't die. Um, most of the products that EMU designed, you, you launch them and uh, 
And they had lifetimes of two years, three years, you'd sell like crazy for the first year, and then you'd just get the, uh, the exponential decay over the next year or year and a half. And so our manufacturing department was terrified um, that uh, that was going to happen to the, uh, to the SB 1200, and they were going to be left with a lot of stock, particularly because some of the components were becoming end of life. You had to make lifetime buys and things like that. Um, so um, uh, we actually did discontinue the SB 1200 for a while, but the demand came back. And uh, um, uh, as I said, you know, Scott Wedge in particular, the company president was uh, very enthusiastic about supporting the hip hop people. So uh, he insisted we, we, we rebuild build it. Uh, but the final blow came in the late 90s when uh, SSM uh, this had discontinued the 2044. Um, and uh, um, for the last 100 units, again, my tech, Gary Hull, without my knowledge, uh, uh, designed a 2044 replacement, which passed red, uh, muster with some other friends. And uh, that little circuit board went into the last about 100 SP1200s ever built. So um, the SP1200 uh, was discontinued, and by 2018, used working SP 1200s were selling for upwards of $5,000 on eBay. Uh, everybody still, it, the machine wouldn't die. Everybody wants it. So uh, Rossum Electro Music, my current uh, company, we decided to do a reissue of the SP 1200. Uh, it's truly a vintage recreation as true to the original design we were, as we were able to make it. Amazingly enough, all of the analog circuitry is still available in um, you know, modern form that, that, that meets uh, ROHS and other standards. Um, the floppy drives are completely unobtainable. Um, so we replaced that with an SD card subsystem. Um, the original SP12 design, that microcontroller, uh, could accommodate up to 20 seconds of sampling. So I decided to go ahead and uh, fill that out. Again, memory costs nothing today of, of that size. Uh, had to redesign the power supply, both for reliability and also to meet uh, uh, modern uh, uh, power standards. Uh, and while we're at it, because it is a, a, going to be an expensive machine, we upgraded all the panel components to um, uh, super high quality things, but kept uh, the user interface virtually identical. Uh, you can see once we kept the hole in the board over here to, so we could be true to the original IC. There's the microcontroller. We used uh, uh, through hole components uh, where they were available. Uh, that's the sound memory. Those 12 chips of uh, um, a dynamic memory are now reduced down to two. It still uses the Z80 up in the Z80 subsystem up here and the same analog layout and electronics. We had it. Um, down here, we use uh, uh, an SDM 32F4 CPU to control the SD card. Uh, that replaces the disk subsystem. Um, at, with my work with uh, um, Sound Semiconductor, we've replaced the SSM 2044 with the 2144. So that solves that problem over there. Um, we added a few features. Uh, you can now, because these are dynamic filters, there's a board on the back so you can adjust them. That was a modification a number of people made on their SP1200s. There was one unobtainium digital chip, the successive approximation register that implemented the A to D converter. So that's implemented in a complex PLD sitting right here on the board. Switching regulators on the board rather than the uh, transformers and, and so on and, and uh, reg, uh, linear regulator on the back. But we then have the, the post regulators are still analog. So the um, power is there. And then I also expanded this capacitor because the original SP1200 had a terribly noisy interface up to the, the front panel board, and, and uh, I just added more grounds. Also improves the EMI situation a little bit. So that's pretty much all we had to change. Um, the challenges, first off, was deciding what exactly to do, which ultimately we said we have to do a reissue. Uh, of course, in the modern world, component sourcing uh, was a challenge um, and material availability. Uh, there were a few places where I had to re reverse engineer my original design, um, and that took me a little bit of a while. Uh, 
Z80 assembly code. Um, I'm back to writing Z80 assembly code instead of C++. Uh, uh, and that was uh, uh, kind of fun. And then uh, again, in, in, in this world, uh, the production startup, getting these into production was a challenge. But uh, the reception to it has just been great. Um, uh, people testify that, that it sounds exactly the same, which you'd expect, but it's nice to get the confirmation from the golden ears. Now, some people say, because it's an expensive instrument, it's not worth the $4,000 to cash in on the name. What can I do with this that I can't do with an uh, online studio app and a MIDI keyboard? And the answer to that was, it's a piece of musical equipment. If you see the appeal and the value, you will buy one. If you don't, you won't. It's that simple. I've been using FL Studio for 20 years, and if you heard my beats, you would understand why I'm jumping all over the Ross MSP 1200 for four grand. It just makes sense to me. You might not need it or even want it, but that's totally fine. It's not for everybody. So we really appreciated people's comments that would clarify who this instrument was. We thought that used SP1200 would crash in price when we issued this, but instead they've driven up. We, we've seen uh, uh, them selling now for between nine and $15,000 for those vintage original units. So that's the end of my talk. I did want to add, uh, given the uh, uh, Dave uh, Smith's passing away, um, I mentioned him a few times in the talk at Sequential Circuits. Um, and I just want to um, uh, uh, comment uh, for those of you that uh, know of Sequential Circuits, have ever met Dave Smith. He was a wonderful guy. This picture was taken when I was uh, starting Ross and Molecular Music back in 2015. and. Uh, um, uh, Dave was at the NAM show, gave me a big hug. Uh, uh, he's been, had been supportive of Ross and Electro. We shared ideas. I've gone up and talked to him about his instruments. Uh, um, and uh, um, so, uh, and, and we discovered the last time we were together at the NAM show in 2020, uh, that we had even more common roots than we thought. That is, if his parents hadn't had sent him to a private Catholic high school, we would have gone to the same high school together in the same year. We would have been classmates. So um, that was uh, um, pretty amazing. Uh, anyway, so I, I, I'd like just, uh, let's, let's have maybe a, a, a 15 or 20 second uh, moment of silence in memory of Dave, because we'll all miss him. Uh, for those of you who don't know, he was uh, a, a a luminary synth designer, and he passed away completely unexpectedly just a couple of days before the NAM show on, I think it was the, uh, what, the um, very beginning of June of this year. So a moment of silence. Thank you, and thank you, Dave. I'll always remember you. You've been a big part of my life. Um, now we can move to questions and more discussion. Um, I'd like to give a few thanks. Uh, I mentioned Gary Hull, uh, the tech on the SP1200 and still a tech. He was a beta tester, and he created that demo you listened to. And then, of course, my Rossum Electro staff, uh, Sam Botstein, who is uh, our SP1200 guru, guru and our marketing person. Jan Leininger, who is the powerhouse VP Ops, who en enabled us to get this uh, reissue into production. Bob Bliss, the programmer, par excellence. And of course, uh, my standard poodle, Lily, whose picture is on the circuit board, because awesome electric boards always have to have pictures of something interesting on them. OK, I'm going to stop the share, and uh, maybe we, we have some questions. Uh, Neil, you there? Yes. Hi. So, well, thank you very much, Dave. That was an amazing talk. Um, certainly covered a lot of ground. We've had a lot of, of chat on the chat. Um, so for the benefit of everybody else, uh, because this is a Zoom webinar, um, it's difficult to do a Q&A directly. We do have a Q&A button if anybody wishes to ask a question by text. But what we do have is another Zoom meeting where we can all get together and we can all chat. Um, you can ask questions to Dave. I, I, I don't know how long you, you've, you've got for us, Dave, but if you're able to um, 
take some questions in a in a meeting. That would be um that would be awesome. Yeah, I've I've got the next hour blocked out for for this. Uh, um, and uh, after that, all I need is lunch, so we can extend that if need be. But yeah, I'd be, I'd be delighted to meet some of the folks and answer any questions about the SP twelve hundred or anything on on the synthesizer world. I'm just happy to happy to share my Excellent. experience. So my I, I'm so. I'll just post the link back into the uh, to everyone. There we go. So click on the link, and uh, it'll get through to the uh web webinar um uh, to, to the meeting so um but, but before anybody that does that it's um it for, for those who can't make it um we just have a uh, question from luca here um if the 12 if, if the sp1200 was about hip hop how do the uh how do you pan how do you the pan harmonium uh euro rack musically huh? how do you see the panharmonium how do i um how do you see the panharmonium musically, musically. Uh, yeah. well uh you know one of the things i've said many times in my career is um you know i'm not a not a musician uh, my family has musical talent but my father uh, uh was told that his father was a musician and a drunk so he hated music so as I grew up, I hid my interest in music. Uh, it kind of explains this bizarre career of mine. So I don't play any instruments. Um, I love being involved in the production of music. And one of the things I love most is when musicians do things with my instruments that I never expected. So to some extent, um, I have to answer your question is, um, you use it musically however you see fit. And um, the idea is that it's a tool for music. Um, the panharmonium has the ability um, to, it was, originally was, was kind of designed to extract uh, interesting musical features from more complex sounds so you could then take those features and process them with other Eurorack things. So that was our original thinking on the panharmonium before it became a product. As time went on, we discovered there were so many very unusual things to do with it. And uh, things that are unusual are very popular in Eurorack. So we, we created stuff that you really would call uh, more effects, sound effects, or um, you know, uh, many people would say non-musical effects. Um, and those, of course, uh, in the Eurorack market are very popular as well. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure I really can answer as, as to, you know, uh, how do I how do I see it other than um, uh, the stuff that I've seen? I, I quite a bit. Of it. I've I've really been delighted with what people have done with the panharmonic musically. So I, I, hopefully I've answered your question. It's about as good as I can do in answering it. Again, another oh yes yes. So um, that's amazing. So as I said, we have a Zoom meeting um, ready to go. So um, I've. I can post the link into the chat one more time. And then um, we, if you click on that link, then it'll take everybody over to the um, Zoom meeting where we can all um, discuss the SB1200, its history, and any, any questions you have for Dave. In, but before we do that, it remains for me to say thank you very much to Dave uh, on behalf of the Audio Engineering Society. It's uh, a brilliant talk. It's great to hear the history um, from the people who are there. Um, <laughs> first-hand um, knowledge and stories is just amazing to hear, um, both for, 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 for those who work in the industry, but those who are coming up through academia and just learning about these instruments and, and to know what it's all about and, 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 and to inspire and um, people to walk in, in, in your footsteps. Um, and you know, as, 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 uh, as you said earlier, um, Dave Smith, uh, an, an amazing guy, um, created iconic instruments, I think is, is the word. And, and you know, we need more people to, to, to step into those shoes to carry on the cre creative work of, of cre creating tomorrow's instruments um, to Absolutely. carry yeah. on that. Yeah. 
So thank you, thank Neil. You and I'll join you in the chat momentarily. Thank or I'll just join you in the, in, the, in the next next Zoom. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone, and goodbye.